Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to the uh, organization uh, committee for inviting me to this very uh, exciting uh, meeting. So, uh, fighting the ventilator, should I sedate or synchronize, or in uh, other terms, in case of uh, severe patient ventilator asynchrony, should I sedate the patient or synchronize the patient? Here are my conflicts of uh, interests. So, uh, as opposed to uh, controlled mechanical ventilation, in uh, which the, the, the patient is uh, passively inflated by the ventilator, and uh, with the strictly controlled uh, mechanical ventilation, the respiratory muscles are uh, inactive, as uh, soon as we switch to uh, assisted mechanical ventilation, then the respiratory muscles are uh, active. And this is a great challenge, because the ventilator has to cope with this uh, respiratory muscle uh, activity. So here is the, the patient's uh, respiratory cycles, which is made of uh, inspiration followed by uh, expiration. And uh, what we expect from the ventilator is that the insufflation from the ventilator uh, starts when the inspiration of the patient uh, begins. And we also expect that the insufflation stops when the inspiration of the patient stops. It's what we, we try to, to get. And the, the problem starts when uh, those, those two actors are, are not uh, synchronous. And when the insufflation of a ventilator, for example, starts after the beginning of the inspiration from the patient and then continue during the expiration of the patient and things can turn crazy and they could be completely desynchronous. So uh, we can define asynchrony as a mismatch between the patient's spontaneous breathing cycle and the ventilatory cycle delivered by the ventilator. But what is very important is that uh, this asynchrony, which is a, a mismatch in terms of time, is the consequence in general of a mismatch between the patient breathing demand and the level of assistance provided by the ventilator. And then um, either uh, too much uh, assistance from the ventilator as compared to a low demand of the patient, or uh, the contrary, uh, very, uh, uh, very low assistance with regard for a, a very high drive of the patient will create patient ventilator asynchrony. And then now we, we, we understand why, why this question, should I uh, uh, synchronize or should I uh, sedate, is, uh, is relevant. Because if asynchrony is a consequence of an imbalance between the, the assistance provided by the ventilator and, and the drive of the patients, then we have two options. To, uh, to, to correct this uh, imbalance. Uh, we have improving the ventilator settings, which is basically to resynchronize the patients, or to shut down the ventilatory drive, which is to uh, sedate the patients. Of course, we could also uh, try to correct the cause of this uh, problem with the ventilatory drive, which would be to uh, treat the, 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 the cause of the increased or decreased ventilatory drive, but that's another story because this is in general why the patient is in the ICU and this is what we are treating, but it could take days. And last point, why do we care about this asynchrony? Uh, we care about this asynchrony because it seems that patient ventilator asynchrony is associated with a worse prognosis, and patient with a high, uh, high level of uh, asynchrony, here are the red bars, are more likely to be uh, mechanically ventilated more than seven days, or so longer duration of mechanical ventilation, and require more frequently tracheostomy, and then there is new data that have been shown this uh, morning, uh, showing that, that there is higher mortality in this patient. But for, what is very important is that we don't really know today if uh, this is a, a pure association between uh, the prognosis and the asynchrony of if there is a, a, a causality 
between asynchrony and the worst uh, prognosis. In other terms, we don't know, there is no evidence that treating asynchrony will improve the prognosis of the patient. We only know that a lot of asynchrony uh, is associated with a, a bad prognosis, and that, that's kind of important. So uh, let's come back to our, our asynchrony. Here is a, a, a breathing of the patient, and we have its inspiration followed by expiration. And here is what we uh, expect from the ventilator, an insufflation that is synchronous the inspiration and expiration that is synchronous as the expiration of the patient. I will, uh, there, so there's a lot of, of possible asynchrony here, and we don't have time to discuss uh, each of these asynchrony, and I will uh, focus the, the rest of my talk on two major asynchrony, the two main asynchronies, which are ineffective efforts and double triggering. So ineffective effort is, is this one, and it's very simple, it's the, the patient inspired, but he's not able to trigger the ventilator, so inspiration is not followed by a cycle uh, from the ventilator. And the second uh, asynchrony I will uh, focus on is uh, double triggering, is one inspiration of the patient triggers two cycles. So what about uh, uh, the first one, the ineffective effort? So here is an ineffective effort. You can see on these uh, traces that the patient here tried to, to trigger the ventilator, but this uh, attempt was not followed by a cycle. Here is another example here. Uh, this patient had actually EDI, so we have EDI traces here, and there is a, a, a neural inspiration here that is not followed by a, a cycle. So, what causes uh, ineffective triggering? So, the main cause of ineffective triggering is uh, over-assistance. If the patient is over-assisted, is more than he needs, then uh, he, uh, there's a, a um, hyperinflation. Hyperinflation appears, and this causes uh, diaphragm flattening. And this diaphragm flattening has a, a major consequence is that there's, um, uh, it decreases the, the transformation of force into pressure. And it's only a, a problem of, uh, of mechanical uh, condition of the, the diaphragm, but the, the capacity of the diaphragm to generate pressure is uh, lowered by uh, over-assistance. And the, the, the main thing that we can do if we want to resynchronize the patient is uh, to uh, lower the level of assistance, and this will deflate the patients. So this is what did the, the authors in, in this work. Here we have a, a patient with a, a high asynchrony index, and a lot, lot, like 45% of uh, cycles were with a double triggering, uh, sorry, uh, ineffective triggering. Uh, and then the first thing that did the authors, they reduced the level of the pressure support, and this causes uh, uh, deflation of the patients, so it lowered hyperinflation, and then, as you can see, the proportion of, uh, of ineffective uh, triggering uh, decreased. Also, they could reduce inspiratory time, and this had the same consequence, because reducing inspiratory time reduces tidal volume and then uh, reduces the hyperinflation. Another option is to use a proportional mode, such as uh, NAVA, which uh, will uh, prevent uh, over, uh, over inflation. And as compared to PSV here, we can see that with uh, NAVA, as, soon as, as long as we increase the level of assistance, we uh, don't have an increase of the uh, asynchrony index. And while in the, with the pressure support ventilation, when we increase the level of assistance, we have an increase of the proportion of uh, ineffective triggering. And we have the same uh, impact of, of PAV. Uh, with PAV, we have observed exactly the same thing. When we uh, increase the level of assistance, we don't increase the uh, proportion of ineffective triggering, right? while with PSV, we increase the level of triggering. And in that setting, uh, sedating the patient uh, will not 
improve anything. Uh, here is the, the, the relation uh, between the, the RAS and the rate of uh, ineffective triggering. As you can see that if we uh, increase sedation and, and reduce the, the RAS, then we will in general uh, increase the, the rate of, uh, of ineffective triggering. And finally, what is very important with this uh, ineffective triggering is that it doesn't generate dyspnea, or in other terms, it doesn't generate respiratory discomfort. You have here in this, uh, this paper uh, from uh, Lang, uh, the, the, the rate of ineffective uh, efforts as a, a proportion of the, the, as a function, sorry, of uh, the level of the, the assistance. And as long as we increase the level of assistance, the, the proportion of ineffective efforts increase. But uh, concomitantly, the dyspnea decreases. So there is an inverse correlation between the proportion of ineffective efforts and the level of dyspnea. And that's kind of surprising, but patients who have a lot of ineffective efforts they're really comfortable in terms of, uh, of breathing. So, ineffective tri triggering, uh, what I, I, I should do, I should synchronize, and let's be a little provocative, maybe I should do nothing, because I don't know if treating this asynchrony would improve the prognosis of the patient, but what is sure, I should not sedate. So, there is no strong evidence that ineffective triggering is harmful. It does not generate VILI, it does not generate dyspnea. It's associated with longer duration of mechanical ventilation, but there is no causality. So maybe it's only because the patients are severe. Severe patients have ineffective triggering and then lower, longer duration of mechanical ventilation. Synchronizing is very easy. We can either reduce assistance, use proportional modes, and is harmless, except if we decrease too much the level of assistance, because then the patient can become uncomfortable. Sedation is not a good option because it worsens ineffective triggering. The second main patient ventilator asynchrony is the double triggering. So double triggering means the patient inspires and uh, generates two cycles. It's what we have here and here. One inspiration, two cycles. So what's, what's wrong with this trig? The, the first problem of double triggering is very simple. You have a patient, you have set 350 milliliters of tidal volume, and the patient takes two cycles and receives 650 milliliters of tidal volume. Let's be realistic. This is a woman, 166 centimeters, so it's a 58 kilograms ideal body weight. So you chose six milliliters per kilogram, and actually the patient received 11 milliliters per kilogram. So there is a risk of ventilator-induced lung injury. This is the first issue. Second issue, it generates dyspnea. Let's go back to our, uh, to our uh, previous graph. The double triggering in general is associated with uh, a too low level of assistance, what I will show you, and a low level of assistance here is associated with a high level of dyspnea. And patients don't like dyspnea. This is a, a cast of uh, the beginning of the, the 20th century of a, a, a normal subject experiencing dyspnea. And you see that he's not very happy. So is this patient with a, a, a bad, badly set ventilator. So what causes double triggering? Double triggering is caused by under assistance. We have here the flow and pressure traces of a, a patient, and here is the trace of the uh, esophageal pressure. And what you can see here is that uh, the double triggering is caused by a very intense inspiratory effort, so intense that the patient is able to trig the ventilator twice with only one inspiratory effort which means that this patient is not enough assisted. This patient does not receive enough assistance. So what can we do for such patients? This is the very interesting work from uh, uh, Gerald Chang. And what they, they did, uh, uh, 
In this study, they included patients with a, a, high, a, a high level of double triggering. And the physician had three options. First, doing nothing. And, well, this is good news. When you do nothing, nothing happens. And, and then it didn't lower the, the proportion of double triggering. The second option was increased sedation and analgesia. And then this actually lowered the, the proportion of double triggering. And then the third option was to improve the setting of the ventilator. And this was really efficient in uh, lowering the rate of double triggering. So this might be the better option. But be careful. Do not increase tidal volume too much. So in effective treating, I should synchronize or sedate, depending on the risk of VILI. Double treating could be harmful. It can cause VILI. It can cause dyspnea. And synchronizing is very easy. You increase assistance, use PSV, but you can reduce double triggering and dyspnea, but it's harmful if you cause VILI by uh, giving a too high uh, tidal volume. Sedation should be considered if the patient is at risk of VILI. So in conclusion, uh, in case of patient ventilator asynchrony, should I synchronize or sedate? Less sedation exposes to asynchrony. Optimization of ventilator setting should be preferred. And increasing sedation should be avoided, except if the patient has not recovered from his disease. This is the case of double trig in ARDS. Or we should not expose the patient to uh, too high tidal volume. That could cause VILI. And if there is a severe dyspnea, that raises to optimization of ventilator settings. Thank you very much for your attention.